Hello. Hi guys, welcome to the Cambridge Creatives Q&A with Lenny Abrahamson. I'm Hannah. Hi, I'm Fabs. We are the co-presidents of Cambridge Creatives. We are a student-run creative collective. We are curating a series of talks with world-renowned professionals in film, TV and theatre. So please follow our Facebook page to find more about future events. Just a few housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please type them out on the Q&A box just there and we will read them out for you. One, bear with us if there are any technical difficulties and two, let us know in the chat if there are any problems with hearing or seeing us. And importantly, enjoy the Q&A. So our guest doesn't really need an introduction, but Lenny is an Academy Award nominated director for his film Room and he most recently directed the critically acclaimed and lockdown's favourite TV series, Normal People. We are really honoured to have this talented director speak. So my first question for you, Lenny, is when did you know that you wanted to be a director or work in film? Um, I, because I used to, I, when I was a kid, um, and I, I sort of was obsessed with everything I could, I was watch television all the time to, to my parents' kind of horror. And um, I just found, I don't know, I just had a sort of unhealthy or whatever you want to call it relationship with the screen mm -hmm. from very early on. And and I find now with my own kids, like I find it really hard to tell them to get off their devices because I kind of, you know, it's, I think it's probably pointless. Um, but it was probably in my late teens or mid to late teens when I started to watch cinema that was a bit outside the mainstream. And it was actually via the BBC, which we could get in, in the East Coast of Ireland. And, and they used to broadcast um, like unusual American cinema, great yeah, cinema from the great European directors, all this kind of stuff, which for me as a sort of 17 year old was really blew, blew my mind and made me think, you know, I was very interested in literature, very interested in ideas. And I suddenly saw, found this kind of cinema where all these things seem to be synthesized, you know, performance, um, really interesting thematic stuff, and, and just a, 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 something immensely powerful for me anyway. And that was in my head. And I had a friend then, a guy called Ed Guiney, who was uh, similarly obsessed with film. And we, we were in different schools, but we'd meet at like, you know, drinking cans at somebody's party and talk about film all the time. And, what, and when I went to Trinity College in Dublin as an undergrad, Ed, and I was studying science -y stuff, nothing to do with, with film. And Ed phoned me and said, you know the way we're always banging on about films, why don't we do something about it and set up a student society? And actually that's been our relationship ever since because he still produces everything that I do. And um, he's always the one going, yeah, well maybe just think about doing, you know, he's always, I'm the, I'm the one who goes, oh, I don't know. And he's the one who goes, well, why don't we just do this thing in the world, which is a brilliant uh, person to have in your life as well as being a great creative collaborator. So we set this thing up, which is now still called Dublin University Filmmakers and still going. And we made our first shorts there and I think I sort of said I'll be the director and I don't I think it's just what I'd always had a yen towards without actually believing it to be possible and it I think it is important like at various times in your life to try on the clothes of the thing that you might want to one day really be you know what I mean and I think that's what I was doing then was just I, I it was a real I just what I recognize it as something that I felt really kind of drawn to. And so that's when I started, but I still did, I was still on an academic kind of track at the same time because I, I'd actually switched out of sciences into philosophy, which I really loved. And I finished my undergrad degree in philosophy. And then we made a short film, like properly on film, raising very small amount of money. And uh, meanwhile, I applied for graduate programs and I went to Stanford in the States to do more philosophy. But that short film started to gain a bit of traction um, going to festivals and it won some prizes and things. And that's when I decided, actually, if I really am serious about this, um, I should try and do it. And that, but that was at a time in the early 90s when there was really very little happening for, in Ireland particularly. So it was a risky enough move, but I just knew that it was what I wanted to do. It's a bold move. Do you think your study of philosophy like informed your filmmaking? I think they all come from the same root. So um, I can see the connection between them. And I, I think, so, so the impulse to sort of think about things and, and, and try to work things out and be, have an interrogatory sort of attitude to the world, 
or, or, or recognize there are, there are things that I don't quite understand and that I'm drawn to think about, that those are similar instincts. But also in a, in a, in a, in a different sort of um, uh, orientation, you can think about, or at least I can see how the study of philosophy definitely sharpened a sort of way of, of, of thinking and, 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 and presenting ideas in a clear and, and um, powerful way, and which has actually been really relevant, not just to the doing of the filmmaking, but to the pitching of ideas and the persuading of people that they should take what you, you know, they should put their faith in you. So um, the capacity to write clearly and to, and to get underneath the obvious and into the more kind of interesting is a really, really useful skill to have. That's really interesting. Before we go on to talk about room and normal people, we thought we'd delve into Frank a little bit. Um, so the film Frank is a wacky dark comedy about a band with a very eccentric leader. Um, what was the experience of filming that like with such an amazing cast? It was, that was the most daunting, even actually, even now I can say that it was the hardest one of all to make, even though it's quite in a funny way, although not, not entirely, it's quite light. Um, it, it's a, it is a comedy, it's quite slapstick and then it goes darker, but it was really hard because um, it was the first time I'd worked with well-known actors. So there was that sudden difference or potential difference in the relationships on set, like if, where, where you go, okay, so if, 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 if you're working with contemporaries or with young actors or with lesser known actors, the, the kind of, there's an unquestioned shape to the authority, but, but when you're working with sort of stars in quotes, if you if if they don't buy into what your vision is or they don't you know think you're making a good decision they will voice it in a way that as they should but then so you have to be able to handle that conversation i think that was really useful to, thing for me to learn is just um is working in that kind of environment and gaining the trust of re of really strong personalities um which is something if you're doing if you're making theater or film that that you know the, the way in which you collaborate with contemporaries which can be frustrating as well because nobody you know you might be going come on you have to take me seriously i'm the director today you know even though you're just being in the pub with them the night before <laughs> but but at the same time there's no sort of massive pressure but but later on you do find that that like you have to sort of get a handle on how to hold strong personalities and forge them into a unit and make them get behind your vision of things so there was that, and then also the music. The music was really hard because we we filmed it live. We didn't use backing tracks. They really played the instruments, but they're not musicians. They're musician-ish, if you know what I mean. Um, and just the tone of Frank, you know, it's on the one hand, it's a kind of romp, and you've got this central character with a big fake head. I should have brought it in. Actually, it's, in, it's on top of the fridge in the kitchen. Oh. Um, but um, it was... Uh, you you trying to make you know this this the scary part of Frank was was really just will this work at all you know will will this strange tonal uh, amalgam actually hold together in a way that doesn't just seem ridiculous to an audience and and it sort of did which is which always feels like a bit of a miracle. Um, slightly going on from that, talking about the head, how did you work with Michael Fassbender in being emotive and acting whilst having a massive mask thing but, on his you know, head well it's amazing because people people it seemed to convince people to the extent that they asked the question oh were there different masks were the expressions subtly different actually no it was always exactly the same i think what it shows you is something amazingly um fundamental to um storytelling in on film which is that massive massive amounts of what you think you're looking at you're bringing yourself as a viewer you know those famous experiments where it's psychological experiments where they would take a f film a, a person's face in, in a neutral kind of expression and then intercut that shot with either something very warm and fuzzy or something really horrible and audiences were shown one or the other and asked to describe the expression on the face and they would say of you know one oh it's it's a, it's a quiet contentment and of the other one it's a deep um frozen horror you know and so 
you bring those things to the mask. And we, we see that with animation all the time. We're like, you can animate stick figures and make people cry with the right story and music and bodily shapes. And so there are so many cues that are coming over, even if the face isn't changing. And then I suppose the final thing is, um, <clears throat> you know, um, there's the filmmaking language itself. Because one of the questions I, I thought about was, is there any point in cutting to a close up of Frank? You know, because you don't, it's not like you're going to learn anything new. You know, if you cut to a close, if you're looking at somebody and something happens in a scene that you feel may affect them in some sort of important way, and you decide in the edit to go, right, well, let's, let's just look at them a little bit more closely. Let's study them at this moment. You will see more detail on a face when you go in, but Frank doesn't change ever. And yet close ups prove to be essential because they tell you something. They tell you how to think about the image as a viewer. They tell you think more about Frank at this moment. And I found that really interesting. That, that whole thing as a filmmaker was really interesting. I suppose finally you have Michael, you know, who's just got this charisma, this great play with his voice, really, really kind of wiry, odd, angular body. Um, and, and, and he just, and, and like the intrigue, you know, he, he becomes some, he becomes a, a, a way, a place that collects meaning. It, 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 funny enough for the viewers, just like for the characters around him. So Donald Gleason's character is obsessed with what Frank might be thinking. Frank gets more interesting because he's covered, not less. Because he's, uh, he's, he's capable of being projected onto. And the same thing happens for the audience. That, and that's the game of the film. It says you are over investing in the myth here. And now we're going to take the head off and you're going to see what he really looks like. And yeah, so it was really, I found it from a, from a kind of, you know, philosophy of film standpoint, really interesting. Talking about the, the philosophy of film and the skill behind filmmaking, what are the differences you found between working in TV and film? And do you prefer one to the other? I mean, I would say, um, the differences 10 or 15 years ago were entirely different to, the, to now. So like if, if in the old days, like television, like there were just these big channels. So you can think of them as huge big pipes that had to feed the entire country. You know, they were like, um, so everything, the idea was that everything needed to appeal to the middle. And then the edges were not that interesting to the broadcasters. So things were sort of broader, a bit cruder, whereas films were the sort of more bespoke, director-led um, things, right? And um, that's really changed now because the cleverer broadcasters and streamers, they are, they want things to be like as specific and as like particular as they can be and as authored as they can be. Um, that's not true across the board. Like if you look at Netflix, like most of the stuff is crap, but then there'll be these kind of, like at the top of the, of the, of the peak, there'll be some really good things and same as all of the streamers. Um, and so as a result on normal people, I didn't feel like I had to sort of dumb down anything or change my approach. My approach was as it, like in terms of each individual scene and the level of detail and the kind of richness of of character, I didn't have any difference, detect any difference in myself and how I approached it. Obviously it's, they're half hour episodes, it's a different shape. So you are working to the specifics of the project, which is television. But like in terms of the old fashioned meaning of the diff, of, of, oh, television versus film, where you go, okay, well, that's what you do if you're just a jobbing director, whereas films are where you can express yourself. That's kind of gone. Having said that, I still think the experience of watching a film in a theater is a profoundly special thing. Um, and one of the things that's different is just, again, it's about how, how viewers approach the two things. Like if somebody goes to see a film and they, they sort of invest their time, you know, to leave the house and go and buy a ticket and everything, and they sit there and the lights go down as, as a, as a director, you know, that you have them for, you have their participation for at least 15 or 20 minutes. And because, because that, and so they sit there ready to enter this world and you have time to create, to sort of teach an audience the sort of film that they're watching. You know, you've time to, to slow everything down and get rid of the expectations of speed and 
story if that's what you want to do, you know? And there's that attentional capital that they that you have to play with. Whereas if you are making something for television, the entire focus of everybody's obsession is the first five minutes of the first episode. Because you people are sitting there with a remote control in their hand. And if for half a second they feel it might be more interesting to watch David Attenborough on BBC Two, then they will do it. So I think that's really difficult. It pushes you towards a sort of perhaps a hookier, more glossy approach. And with normal people, we had to make a really conscious effort not to do that and to say it'll either stand or fail by being what it is. And my assumption was that we would lose loads of viewers in the first episode. And, and I think it's a testament to Sally's book because it's so loved. And also maybe to the fact that just it so happens that people are, are a little tired of the, of the kind of gloss and sensational flavor of a lot of television that for a change, a more naturalistic approach actually um, held you, you know? So, uh, and that was probably the only place we ever had any discussions with, particularly the American broadcaster was, was around the first five minutes, which, which is so interesting that that's, like that's where they think, oh no, they think we've got a great show. So please, please just make the opening really sexy so we don't lose people. <laughs> and our argument was, well, if we do that, then everything afterwards will feel like a flat. You know, you just can't, you can't lie to people. You have to sort of be, you have to say, no, we will do it. We will be sort of low key and let the quality of the performances and the writing and the, and the shooting be the thing that, that keeps you there. And it proved successful. Thankfully. Um, how has the creative process differed from directing an adaptation or an original to an original screenplay? I think by the time you get to this directing part, it feels the same because you, you need to sort of have taken ownership of it. And, and the, uh, uh, after a certain point, you go, I can't remember whether this was or wasn't in the novel. It's just, it's the thing itself. I think the danger with an adaptation is that if you get caught between two stools, and you sort of go, um, but in the book, too often. I mean, we my adaptations have tended to be very, to use that awful word, faithful in the sense that I think for most audiences, they won't go, oh, that's a big shift. But there are lots of small shifts, um, which, which, because, and the rule has to be, it has to work. The version that you're making has to, if it's a TV show, it has to work as a TV show, or if it's a film, say with room, it has to work. And in both of those cases, the authors were also involved. So, but I never had any pushback from like in, in room, we changed quite a lot of what happens in the second half of the story. But again, unless you read the book closely before you watch the film, you, you won't feel that. I think it feels true. Um, I think like, as I, I'm keen now, I've done quite a number of, adaptations and I'm really keen to get back to some of the original projects that we're developing if only because I think it's I think it's sort of better for cinema generally to to pro be, be a primary generator of stuff um having said that I'm going to do another adaptation because I couldn't <laughs> say no um, I'm going to do Sally's other book conversations with friends also for the BBC but after that, I think I'm going to, yeah, I've got an original film that I want to do next. Amazing. Do you have any advice for students who would like to follow in your footsteps and be a director or a filmmaker? I think the best advice, there's no sort of, okay, there's two ways, right? One is to go to film school, which I think is really valid. And there are some really good ones. And I would definitely say it's better to go to film school after you've done your primary degree or even more than your primary degree, because, because I think, going straight to film school from school is too young. Um, um, so I would think if that's one really valid way to go, just make sure that it's a really good place. And I think what you get mostly from that is just the fact that you will, in virtue of the way it works, have to make some things and you will have to collaborate with people and you'll probably meet people um, at your sort of point in life who are similarly passionate. And that's actually the best way for work to get made is, is those small collectives that naturally form. And the best thing about film school is that it, it, it saves you from that thing of sort of sitting in your room and going, how on earth do I get from 
this point where nobody has a clue who I am and I have no track record, how do I move? And, with, and that can be a bit paralyzing. But the other way to work is just to start making things, um, which is so possible now given technology. Like you can, you know, with your iPhone actually and a, and, and a relatively cheap rig, which you can buy now, and somebody doing sound and um, working with actors that you believe in um, on simple projects that are possible to achieve, you know, in your spaces that you already have. I think you can do amazing things like that and you can share them. And, and actually there's such an appetite for new voices and for people who can, I don't know, cut through to meaningful stories and people sometimes think of the industry as this kind of monolith, like, like the MI6 building or something, or, you know, where it's like just that you think, oh my God, what goes on behind those walls and how might you ever get in? Actually, it's full of producers going, the scarcest commodity is talent. And so if you can make something that just has something about it, that, you know, I think you can get that through and you can find people who will be interested enough. Plus you probably have to do that if you're going to go to a good film school anyway. So the answer then is just, um, if you want to make things, if that's your aim, you should ask yourself, why am I not doing it now? Because unless, unless you want to make things because you want to be that person who you fancy yourself as being five years from now, that's not, you sh the reason you want to be a filmmaker is because why? Because you want to make films. It's in the name. And then, so that means nothing is stopping you right now from doing that. So that's how to start. Thank you. That's really useful advice. Um, it's a bit like saying I want to be a writer. So I'm going to go and how do I get myself to the point where I'm sitting at a desk writing and people reading my work? Hmm. Well, probably just start sitting at a desk and writing. Mm -hmm. Very, very valid advice. Um, so moving on to room, um, it must have been really challenging to ad adapt it from a perspective of a five-year-old to a realistic portrayal of Ma. Um, how did you go about that? That's, that was precisely the challenge in a way, you know, it, or I can turn it around and go, film is such an objectively, it's, it's, so, it's so geared towards an objective uh, POV, right? If you think about it, when a writer writes, they, 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 nothing is there and everything they put can be controlled. And, and, and so writing is a clever kind of activity in that, in that you're taking nothing and starting to form something. Cameras are really stupid in the sense that, you know, you, you, you put them in front of something and they just, everything pours in, undifferentiated, you know? And so what you know when you're dealing with a, with a situation as kind of overwhelming and, and powerful objectively as the situation that the two of them are in, how do you stop that just crushing the boy's point of view? So it's kind of what's hard. And now, so the, the, the thing is that you could go super, you know, um, uh, magic realist about it or whatever. And, and I know that those were sorts of pitches that Emma got. And I was really, I just thought, well, that'll be fine, but we'll have no emotional power and um, what the challenge is can we really show the place and at the same time understand the boy's take on it the mother's take on it is is going to be so present because it's exactly what we're thinking as adults how do we how do we hold that back in the film in a way that isn't sort of silly or or kind of um magic-y you know like animation sequences or you know, we did, we, we did use some voiceover, which is, which is, you know, that is not a pure, like that, that, that is, that, that's cheating and, but it's acceptable for me, I think, in the context of that, just to center you on Jack's voice at the minute, at the beginning. And then I think it was just, how do you make the place feel like a universe rather than a, a constraint? And how do you make the outside world feel oppressive? You know, it, it was all those things. I found that was really, it was like for Frank in a way, it was another huge challenge, sort of from a technical point of view. And so what was really interesting, we thought when we were planning it, that we would have to make the room actually bigger than it is in the novel. Because we thought, well, you just couldn't film in it and it will just feel like, you'll immediately go, oh, forget it. Like this is the most, this is hell. I'm in a, I'm in a kind of dungeon prison cell there's, there's no way we can feel the, the sort of the, the richness of the boys experience. And so what we did to test it 
in the studio, we got a um, bunch of theater flats. Well, a film, you know, flats from set builds and a, bu- and a bunch of people to help us move them and some lenses. And we, start, we, we started with like a room probably a bit bigger than the one I'm in or even a bit bigger than that so that it felt like a big, big enough sized room. But we thought, well, we can just frame it in a way that, you know, makes it whatever we need and we'd be able to work in it and won't feel so claustrophobic. And as soon as we did that, we looked look through the lens it just didn't mean anything it just felt well there there's nothing to it it loses everything so we started moving the walls in and by the time we got to a point where we felt this is really interesting now it was pretty much the size that it's that it is in the novel um and what we worked really hard at to do then was to like create different areas within it so that it felt like a multi-location even though it's a tiny box the sink and that we put a lot we did really small things like we put a um a light over the sink which was like a strip light and between the skylight the lamp by the bed and the strip light that gave us three light sources that we could create radically different um times of day and atmospheres in the room and then you have the sink world you have sink and bath world you have under the bed you have the whole wardrobe you have the bed itself you have the television area and actually by the time we finished shooting it it really felt like it was a you know, I had exactly the same conversations as I would if I was shooting in a big house. Where, where are we setting this scene, you know? And the answer wasn't in the room, because obviously it's in the room, but it's, you know, it's what world within that can you, can you create? But we never cheated. We didn't open the walls out. We didn't, it really was in that space. So we sort of took the challenge seriously. That's really, really interesting. Um, how did you go about casting room? And did you do it, have to do any psychological tests for child actors? How did you go about the casting process? Um, so it just took a long time. We, we gave ourselves about three or four months, maybe. Probably, no, maybe a bit longer, four or five months. Because the way we thought about it, the way we were advised by people who'd done sort of casting for young children before was, you might want to give yourself a year because you think, oh, well, it'll take us ages. And if we don't find this kid the whole thing is dead um but then if you cast somebody eight months or nine months away from the shoot at that age they'd have changed so much by the time you get there so you, the the sweet spot was like the time we gave ourselves and saw maybe thousands of little boys for 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 jack um, and there were only in the end about four or five who i thought were even remotely possible with jake as a sort of very right out front um and we didn't do any, any psychological testing except that we spent quite a lot of time with them. And I directed them each to see how they responded to me. And oh. Lenny, back. can you hear us? Oh, I've got you. Am I back? Oh, yeah, you're back. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, my, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to change my connection to my phone connection um, because, well, actually that seems to be okay. If I freeze again, I'm going to change my internet connection and see what happens. Yeah, it's come back quite strong now. So I think it- Brilliant. Think it, yeah. Cool. So, so yeah, it was really just finding whether he, he had the stamina and the, and he enjoyed it, you know? And Jake initially was very, like he'd done some commercials and things like that. And he was a little bit sort of child actorly. And I was uncertain at the beginning because I thought I want to find a boy who just naturally occupies space in the way that we want him to, rather than, you know, it would be a a sort of classic directorial thing to say, oh, no, no, I don't want any like drama school kids because they'll just be, you know, it'll all be just too much. But actually he had some of that. But once I met him and I took that away by saying, look, I just want you to actually be a bit like you. And he was totally amazed by that. Turns out he's really an actor. so. And I could tell that he could really take direction. I mean, it was going to be really hard and it was, he's still like, it took massive effort. And sometimes we had to do it in tiny little chunks and still make it flow. But, um, and he had lovely parents as well, which was a part of our choice because they were not pushy. They were, he was the one who loved acting. You know, all of those things were really important. And we felt like it was something that he was the one that we would pin our, pin our colors to. Mm. Um, in terms of room, it's obviously got a very sort of harrowing story at its heart. Did you research real stories of abduction to bring a sense of authenticity to your shoot? Yes, we did. So read everything I could and Emma had already in the writing of the novel, but then we did it again because there are all sorts of things come up. 
like even thinking about what would it, what would it really be like when she arrives home to her house? Like how do news organizations react? Um, how many people would really be there? Um, who would accompany her, accompany her home? What law enforcement, like all those things, like there's a mass amount of research to just make something feel believable. Um, so we did, we researched, I watched lots of documentaries, read accounts, talked to trauma specialists. Um, we didn't approach people who'd been in that situation themselves because it just felt like it would be intrusive and wrong. So we just did it ourselves. And, and in the end, you always have to imagine a lot because, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna just change my internet connection. Just give me a sec. Hopefully it'll work. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go a bit funny for a sec. <laughs> give me a sec. Come on. Yeah, that's better, I think. Back. Lovely. We can see. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we just to do all that research and and and, and try and you know understand it, but in the end, it, you, you have to go back to your imagination because no matter how, uh, something I really learned, no matter how much you research something, even a real event. In, in fact, especially a real event, you'll go. The questions never stop. There is no such thing as a full account of reality. And what do what would a mother and a daughter say to each other when they close the front door of the house after the daughter has been abducted for seven years? And there's a new, and there's a little kid there, and there's a mother's new partner. Like, no, there's no way of you cannot research that. You just have to find it and believe it, and have it based on the characters that you've created or Emma's created and we've interpreted. So yeah, it, lots of research, but in the end, that just gives you some confidence to make leaps of the imagination. Um, you spoke a bit about um, working with child actors like Jacob. Um, we heard about like the shouting matches on set oh, to yeah. remove any self-consciousness. Is, yeah. is that something that you really wanted to bring um, when um, directing? Yes. I mean, with a child particularly, you know, no matter how kind of a prick he was and how much he'd done a bit before, it was still a huge thing to have all these adults and this pressure and kids react in odd ways. Like they become a bit naughty or uh, in his case that day, it was like, um, just it was shyness and it was not wanting to be horrible to this lovely actress that he was working with even though they'd spent you know we really got them together quite a lot it was still hard and and you realize i could go all tense up to him and go jake it's really important now i need you to make it make us believe that you're really afraid but all of that's like just going to make him anxious so instead you go i you can shout better than that and 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 i would i would say i would start shouting at the first AD going, can I have a cup of coffee, please? And he'd shout back at me and, and then it's a game. And then he suddenly realizes the freedom he has to just like bellow and, and, and immediately he smiles at me afterwards. He doesn't feel awkward because he feels like it's part of this. I found that it was so interesting. I described uh, directing a child, like people say, what were your methods? And, and the answer was like absolutely anything that would work. Um, and it, it felt like you're falling over, you're, scra you're falling down a sort of steep bank and you're just grabbing at every root and branch that you can to hold yourself from, from going. And sometimes that was like really simple direction, like telling him what he felt, which is sort of what you don't always do with an actor, with a grown up actor. Um, and sometimes it was these kinds of mecha mechanical, physical things, which I love actually. I love directing from the outside in. You know, I really like that with some actors, it works really well when you're talking about movement, voice, um, affect, like what are they like when you meet them? What does it feel like? Rather than starting necessarily with a very deep sort of psychological portrait. And with the kids, you can't, you can't talk psychology. So you are obliged to work in a much more kind of external way. But I think that leads to beautiful things sometimes. How much freedom did you give the actors? Were there any... Um, possibilities of improvised moments yes so especially on scenes where what is said isn't vital but a sort of feeling of how they interact like when we observe them from the outside like if they're playing and when they're like having a hamburger together towards the end of the film um 
that would always be um we would like give them patterns and things to talk about and i've done that in other films as well i did a film called what richard did where um was lots of people in their late teens and some of the stuff is really carefully scripted and some of it is purely improvised around topics and and i think mixing those two things works really well but generally particularly with the boy it the, it was written very carefully. So in, in the key kind of dramatic scenes, I would change things if it felt like awkward in the mouth of the actor or they didn't like it or they had a, we had a better line. You know, it often happens. But, but it wasn't improv. And improv, you just have to use it very carefully because if you improv dramatic scenes with actors who aren't really good at improv, it always just turns into an argument, you know, because actors will or any of us will go well they'll turn they don't want to be hung out to dry with not knowing what to do so well the most obvious thing is to disagree and have a fight and argue because people know what to, what that looks like so improv often ends up way more dramatic people think people think sometimes oh improv is going to make it feel real and actually what improv often does is turns it into a huge big melodrama because that's where you go naturally you know, so I think it's worth being careful if you're making work, how you use improv and standing back and, and still asking yourself that question, do I believe it? Mm. Do you think your work on Room prepared you for normal people, especially when shooting sensitive or, or vulnerable scenes? Yes, I think it was definitely a big part of it. Um, although the nice thing about normal people was that the, the intimacy, particularly my stuff in it, was really kind of positive um and uh but it's still yes it's still from from a doing it point of view you know you still have to take care of cast and crew really carefully and make sure they feel you know creatively involved protected heard all of those really important things so yeah it was i think having dealt with some of the really tough stuff in room and found a way of of working it that that felt like it was Po still creatively positive if you know what i mean separating yourself from the from the material like it's really interesting because acting on the one hand is is diving into something but on the other hand there has to be this tiny separation and that's not just for self protection but it's that's what makes it artistic you know being is not the the end end um aim it's like it's a sort of profound act of representation and for that there has to, the actor has to remain at some deep level also in control. And um, what, what's interesting about when it comes to really intimate material is that becomes even more important. Otherwise, it's as if we're asking the actor to like express themselves sexually, which would not be, that's too, that's, that's their private world and shouldn't be, you know, and 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 so in a sense what you're doing is still representing it's like you're the life drawing model you know you're the person involved in the creation of the image and of the moment on screen with the director with the with the crew with the dp and all that and that that's an empowering position to be in and and, and the old sort of way of people going okay i don't really know what to say so guys just if you feel okay about it can we just sort of you know and i think that's just not that's not acceptable anymore. Um, you know, and we work, work with an intimacy coordinator and it's a brilliant role, which just gives you a slightly more public space between director and actors to really question what you're doing, make sure that consent is being really explicit because you need to work with consent in the scene itself as well as, sorry, in the making of the scene as well as within the scene, you know, where are actors comfortable? Where aren't they comfortable? Knowing that in advance so that there's no sort of, oh, can we just busk it and see what happens sort of aspect to it. Um, so moving on to normal people now, which people will be very excited about. Um, the book has been lauded for putting its finger on millennial experiences in a way that hasn't been done before. How did you go about translating that to the screen? Well, as, as not even, I mean, I, I'm not a boomer, thankfully, but only <laughs> just, I'm actually um, just in the beginning of Gen X. I was saying this very definitely to somebody recently. My son said, okay, boomer to me. <laughs> He's 12. Um, but, uh, um, but, but 
but it is interesting because I think in a way it sort of does an, a, a, an injustice to Sally because although she's dealing with the experience of people of that, you know, generation, the work is much like, it's not just a sort of local generational kind of, she's not reporting from the front line of millennial experience. She's a proper author and she's dealing with human uh, experience, you know, but it is true that she also understands her generation really, really well um, and understands a kind of, what I got from the novel was a kind of deep concern in all of her writing around the idea of whether you fit or don't or what counts as normality and, and, and the kind of de- the necessity that seems to come a lot from social media, uh, you know, which is the relatively new thing in our world of, of, of standing out, of representing yourself in some sort of special way, right? Which my generation didn't have. Um, because it was just you and your friends and that was it. And there was no sort of other space in which to be critiqued or, or to succeed or fail. Um, but I think the guide was the book in that department. You know, we, we just, and working with Sally and making sure that what we were doing was true to it. And at the same time, making it really stand as a piece of screen storytelling on its own. Um, and I'm really glad that the audience, and I think even the broadcasters felt the made the mistake of believing that the audience would be really skewed towards the generation that it represents. But actually, in fact, it's had a huge audience right up to people in their 80s. And, you know, my mum's friend, my mum's in her 80s, but her friend is in her early 90s, called my mum after like a couple of episodes and said she thought it was great. And she thought the sex scenes were beautiful and very realistic. And I thought, that's really sweet, you know. <laughs> um, so so I, I feel like... Um, I'm glad that the series itself feels like it's not, it is about that millennial generation, but it is not exclusively for that generation. Yeah, that's really interesting. I actually love that so much. Um, You went to Dublin, uh, to Trinity yourself. Did you, did that give a better understanding of how to shoot, where to shoot and what was important in the shooting of it? Yeah, I think it did. But I think the key would have, the, the core of that would have still been true, even if I'd been to a different university, because it's so, it's so universal what, what Sally describes. I mean, and I didn't grow up in a small town in the west of Ireland, but I sort of felt I'm Irish, so I do, and I've spent much time on the west, and, and I know it, so yeah. But yeah, there was a very special um, quality to doing the Trinity stuff, because I'd spent so many years there. I mean, I did maths physics for, for like, two years, took a year off and then did a four year philosophy degree. So I was like a perpetual student. And I lived in this boat. I lived in the red brick house, uh, red brick rooms that are where they meet each other again in college for the first time. I lived in front square for a while. So I, I knew all of the, and I've studied in the library where he studies. And I did that same scholarship exam and I did it in the desk that we placed it. I mean, I did all my work in the desk that he, I placed oh him in. So that was just a nice personal thing to be able to represent the college. And I think also that experience of feeling a bit overwhelmed by university at the beginning. Everybody, unless you're probably, unless you're a sociopath, you probably, everybody feels that. And, and I remembered it really, even though I didn't, again, I came from a family who's other members had been to the college, but it still had that effect on me, as I'm sure it did on everybody on this call. However confidently you might hold yourself, you know, it's a massive new world and what's it going to feel like? So, and I, I remember, and actually also not much felt like it had changed, which was amazing because it's, I haven't been, I haven't been in, I haven't been a student in Trinity for 33 years or something ridiculous like that that makes me even kind of maybe 34 it makes me sort of horrified to to even say but it felt the same like there was accessibility to people with disabilities there's like health and safety stuff like fire alarms and you know all of that was new um but everything else felt the same Mm. did you use that when you were talking to daisy and paul were you like so this is how it feels to be a student and sort of try and get that into the yeah, I mean, Paul had gone to the Lear, which was a drama school, which is actually associated with Trinity. So he probably had some se- he had some sense of it. Daisy um, hadn't, and I think she went straight into acting from from school. So um, yeah, I think I was able to talk about that, and I was able to talk about like the details of 
aspects of the story, which I just knew really well independently. So when questions would arise about, well, how would this actually work? Or, you know, um, what would you be expected to do in these lectures and stuff? I was able to sort of know all that, which was, which was quite nice. How else did you work with Daisy and Paul in order to sort of curate their, their character and direct them? Um, spent the most more time you can spend and not necessarily with informal rehearsal, but just generally hanging around with people, talking about the project, getting a sense of them. For me as director, it's like really important to feel my way around them as people and, and how they react and what they look like. And those things stay in my head and then I use them when we're working try and move towards what the person is like um, or, or things that are exciting about the person or intriguing and, 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 and th that's great for me and watching them together is great for me but for them as well it's that kind of immersion in the world of the production so not a vast amount of rehearsal nothing like it would be for a play but and not rehearsing to get to um, perfection but to get to something which we feel excited about and then leave it until the day. Um, but yeah, Daisy, a lot of work on accents because obviously she's from Britain. So she's not, um, she, her mum is Irish and that helped. Um, but, but getting that right was really big part of it. And actually that's a really nice sort of work to do because it's quite kind of process driven and mechanical, but you real, you are still feeling your way towards character in that. And, you know, so, I suppose just, and they're also super talented actors, so it's what they do, it, you know, so much of it is also what they show me and I just go, wow, that's amazing. And ha and, and it's just, just such a kind of pleasure to, um, you know, observe and to be working with that material that's so alive, you know, uh, it's, it, it was, it was a privilege. Um, plus they're, they're so, the energy of, of the cast, because they're young. And it's the opposite as well of that thing of, of, big egos on set, which we were talking about earlier. Um, because everybody there is just, they're starting out, they're really enthusiastic. And I'm more of a dad figure than a kind of, a, you know, somebody to challenge and front up to. Um, the only thing about that is it adds even more pressure, I think, to, to those, to doing those intimacy, intimate scenes really carefully. Because if you're a young actor and you're working with an established director, it's so tempting to say, yeah, yeah, sure. No, I, I'm totally fine with that. Even if you aren't, because you don't want to disappoint. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you, you, you're duty bound as the director in that situation to find ways of making sure that people are really comfortable and not just, not just trying to be helpful, you know? Yeah. Do you have any favorite memories from set when working with these young actors or working on location in Italy, for example? But so two, I did, Hetty did Italy, so I finished an F6, although well, there was a producer across all of it. Um, I, the two, the sort of really favorite memories for me, I shot the stuff in Sligo on the beach, and that was such a beautiful day to be on this, on that amazing location. And we were well, well into the shoot at that point, like two thirds of the way through, and everybody was really working well. Something lovely about it, just physically being there. But I think my favorite memories are around her, Dublin House, which is a beautiful house. And it looks like that. There's a wonderful woman who owns it. It's been in her family for generations. Her nieces came up from the country and lived there when they went to college. So it was really like, it was right for the place. And it was beautiful weather. We would sit out on the steps and have coffees and talk in between scenes or, and there was just such a lovely feeling of collective um, creativity around it. And, and the location was gorgeous. and. Yeah, I remember that was that was just particularly sort of happy as a as a place to work. Amazing, cool. Um, I think we'll have to go on to the questions now from the audience. Um, please type your questions. I know loads of people have already, but please type your questions in the Q and A box, and we will read them out. Um, while we're waiting, we will ask our final questions. One quick question from me. Um, you've probably been asked this question way too much, but who made the decision about Connell's chain, um, which has got a lot okay. of popular attention? There is slight, there are slight, okay, I can tell you a story that is, that happened, but it may not be, it may not be the reason why. Okay, so Susie Lavelle, who is the, the cinematographer for my section, an amazing woman and brilliant. I was saying about the chain and she said, well, do you not remember? And I, this was great because I, I, I have no memory of this, but she said, we were sitting in a meeting and we were talking about how 
we wanted to concentrate on sort of Connell's neck and three quarter back shots on him because it's just not quite being able to see into his eyes, but knowing he's thinking something and how, how much he blushes and you see it on his neck. And apparently, according to Susie, I said, we mustn't forget the chain that's mentioned in the book because that will be a, just an, an object to think about when you're, you know, a sort of focal point on those shots. And she said, I texted Lorna Marie Mugan, the wonderful costume designer on the show, and said, mustn't forget Connell's chain. Now, having said that, she probably hadn't forgotten Connell's chain. So she probably had it anywhere anyway because it's written in the book. It's, it's talked about as Argos chic. Now, do you have Argos in, in Britain? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so you know what it is. Um, so that, so I, I like to think that I, um, that it would have been forgotten had I not said that, but I suspect it would have been there anyway. <laughs> and now it has something like 200,000 Instagram followers or something. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. It has its own fan base. <laughs> it's amazing. Incredible. Yeah. Our final question for you is, do you have any TV or film recommendations for our lockdown, apart from normal people? Um, apart from normal people, I, what have I watched? Um, I was, I'll tell you what I was actually watching was film stuff. Um, there's a brilliant service called Mubi, M-U-B-I. And it, it, you can, it's quite cheap to sign up to and they've got like 20 films on at any one time and you, and they, they, new ones arrive and old ones drop off. So you're sort of encouraged to go, oh, I better watch that before it's gone. And they're really fascinating old French cinema, odd American movies that you haven't seen, things like that. So watch a bit of that. I don't know if it's still on, but I thought Atlanta was really good. I think it was Netflix. Um, I, I'm going to start watching The Great, which is Hulu. So I don't know if I've been managing to sort of sneakily get a link to it. Um, I'm, I haven't watched Succession yet, but I've heard that's really good. Um, what else? What have you been watching so that I kind of have something to watch? To be honest, basically all the stuff that's been coming up on Cambridge yeah. Creatives, but um, <laughs> Killing Eve's quite a basic one, but something oh, yes. that's absolutely that. really that, That's on the list for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, should we go to the questions from our audience? Adam Goot, I think is how you pronounce it, asked, was, the con was there a conscious reason going into the project that the episodes would be 30 minutes long? And does the shorter length for a drama have an impact on the show? Yes, we, we thought really hard about it and we knew it was going to be TV first off rather than film because it's episodic, it takes place over a long period of time and, it, and, and TV would put, a movie would put too much pressure on a sort of central dramatic climax that the thing doesn't naturally have. And, and for the same reason, actually for the reason of, of, of the fact that the story is quite low key and in a way normal, right? It felt like really concentrated small encounters with key phases of their relationship would be more powerful than like manufacturing a full hour of wh where there's more pressure on plot and story. So these were more like short stories or studies. And even though people watch, and, and it's, not, it's not usual because normally dramas, drama is longer and it's comedy that's the half hour. Um, but what we have noticed is that when people watch even multiple episodes at once, if they binge watch, it still feels chaptered. It still feels like you, you understand that thing. And the novel has that quality as well. She goes in short, very forensic, examinations of different phases of the of the relationship so I was moving around in time so yeah it, that was a thought we had right at the beginning um what was the decision process for you taking the first half of the series and Hetty taking the second and how did you establish a, a cohesive style between you I could have done all of us because I'm a producer on it and I could have done that there, there were practical reasons the practical reason boringly is just schedule we wanted it to deliver it at a certain time for the broadcasters. And if I was to do all of them, I wouldn't have been able to be in the edit on my episodes for another 10 or 12 weeks. And it would have delayed everything by about three months. And that would have been tricky. Um, but also I have other things that I'm trying to work on. And I thought if I, if you do the first episodes of something, you get to cast it, uh, create the mood, you know, do all the things that you do in that part of that key part of the creative process. So I still felt in a greedy way that I had ownership of it, but I could then go and, and work on other things as well. But I think the third reason and perhaps the deeper reason is just that we thought it would be interesting to get a fresh aesthetic 
sensibility onto the show halfway through because the thing kind of does break down into into two halves you know the second half is is tonally a bit different to the first half and so we thought it'd be an opportunity to bring somebody like Hetty, who's really established director with her own strong aesthetic kind of instinct and let her bring her th- vision to that in terms of handover had conversations at the beginning um obviously when we were talking to Hetty about doing it and then I we we chat every so often I tell her how I was thinking about my section and then I let her have complete access to all my rushes and all the rough assemblies as we went so she had she had the option to see what I had done and then I just had to trust her that she would um impose her vision but within a structure that was already created and 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 I think she really did so it was you know I think I was also, it, I, I shot for like 10 or more weeks, um, having done like eight weeks of like absolutely intense preps. So you're looking at 18 or 20 weeks. And by the time you get to that point, you're just so knackered. Um, and I think it's like, it's like the Le Mans, TV is like the Le Mans 24 hour race. You need to, you know, it's just it's not, not like a feature. You just, it's such a long haul that I think it, it just makes sense. Having said that, I found it still quite hard to just say bye to everybody and go back to the edit. It was really hard. Um, a question from Holly Thick Thickness. Um, she was wondering about um, the casting of the Zimbabwean actor Lancelot Nkube as Lucas, um, Marion's photography yeah. boyfriend, who's explicitly described as Scandinavian in the book. And yes. more widely, what influenced the decis- that decision and what was the implications of race considered in casting choice? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. We were very keen and we wanted to try and make the show as diverse as we could. Um, uh, but it's also, Ireland is still massively monocultural. Now it's changing, thankfully. We've had much more sort of, it's much richer than it was when I was a kid. Um, and um, but, but still, it's still very monocultural. So there's not a, there isn't a huge um, uh, sort of pool of, of diverse um actors to cast from, but we wanted it to where we could to, to, to make sure that we tried to represent the newer Ireland. Um, and then when it came to Lancelot, he just actually was the, he's a Swedish actor, actually. I mean, he's, he's Swedish. He may have come originally from Zimbabwe, but he's nice. He's, he lives in and, and um, works in Sweden. He's on a, quite a big show over there. And he was just the actor that felt the best at that part. And he brought a certain kind of softness to Lucas, which I felt like, I think we felt probably, you know, some of the peripheral characters, because they're described from Conal or Marianne's point of view, can become, they can shrink to the view that Mark Conal and Marianne have of them. But as soon as you make a f- something on screen, you have the full person there and you have to think about that. That was particularly true, I think, of Marianne's mother, who I think we gave a dimension of, of pathos to in the, in the adaptation when she is, in the novel, just really cruel, I think, in an, in an unrelieved sort of way, in Marianne's head. Um, so I thought Lancelot brought this kind of delicacy to it and that felt, he just felt like the right person. And so we didn't, I mean, we certainly didn't think about, we, we thought about um, diversity uh, in terms of like representation, but we never thought about it in terms of whether a character was good or bad, which would feel very um, patronizing to say, sort of, if we're going to cast somebody who isn't white, well, we better, you know, they should only play the good characters or something. Cause that would, feel no they everybody should like we should try and be as as uh like find the the people who are best for the roles that we assign them but just try and create as much as we could and we didn't succeed fully in creating a diverse enough cast it's something that i'm more and more aware of true and crew as well um i think in this case we were really really good in terms of gender balance in the crew and um, most of the producers um were women uh, the dop in my block was a woman hetty hetty's dop kate mccullough um uh, one of the first ad's um uh, and then generally speaking it where we could bringing people through and crews i mean it wasn't like like i picked susie because she's fantastic but it was just really nice to be working it, 20 years ago it was like unbelievably rare to find a woman at the head of the camera department now it's much more common and it's and it's really changed the the for the better the way in which that department works. 
That's really interesting. Um, I think this will be our last question, but do you have any tips for people that want to write or direct a film on a shoestring budget? For example, are there any pitfalls to avoid in terms of setting, casting, genre? Yeah. I think concentrate and uh, like the mistake is to try to do something ambitious, too ambitious from a production point of view. And then all that happens is you're constantly just making compromises to make it possible. Whereas I once set a task for a bunch of, um, film students um and um the title of the the brief for their short was just i am here um and it was like from one of those map things or you are here you know the map things where there's a little red dot mm. and the point of that brief was just if you start there and you and you kind of find a way with the minimum shifting to document something about the world you're from or in, using the spaces that you have, um, then I think, and, and putting, you know, not creating the need for special effects or complicated stuff, keeping the number of characters low, trying to make it so that you can shoot in available light. Um, like there are a million trillion extraordinary stories that you can tell within those constraints that will allow the actual quality of the writing and filmmaking brain to, to show through and not the limitations of the technology. Other top tip, um, like I can say this as somebody who know, has fallen into this hole at the beginning many times, it's really boring and technical, but people will put up with any amount of fuzzy picture or not, you know, rough handheld iPhone quality, but bad sound just totally throws you out. It's like, you notice on this, if, if I went all blurry or if my picture died and you could still hear my voice, it would still work. But if I'm taught, if this is as clear as that, but it's all, then it's like, oh, you know, your brain, sort of really rebels against that. So try and tr try and put a little bit of effort into sound. And the final thing is be ambitious in terms of casting because saying, you know, being ambitious in terms of like special effects would be stupid, right? Because you won't achieve it, but you could be ambitious in terms of casting because if a person says yes, then that's it. That's it's, it's a digital thing. It's binary, you know, they're in or they're not. So don't be afraid to ask people who you feel you've probably got no right to ask to be in your small thing and um, because that will elevate it. But yeah, I think that, that that's my practical top tips. Thank you, amazing advice. Um, I think that's all we have time for, unfortunately. Thank you, Lenny, for your wonderful answers and for giving us your time. Uh, thank you for everyone that joined the call and asked such amazing questions. Please thank like our page. Sorry. <laughs> and go, go for it, go for it. Q&A, which is with Jessica Coravos on the 4th of June at 4.45 p.m. Jessica is the president of the really useful group, which is Andrew Lloyd Webber's production company, which produced Cats and Joseph and things like that. But thank you again, Lenny, and thank you so much, everyone, for coming and asking amazing questions. Thanks, everybody, and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.